Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where OP tricks his teacher into writing a hundred lines on the chalkboard. Over the last several months, I've been sick twice. Once, I was out of work for four days due to an awful bout of food poisoning, which may be the worst I've ever felt, and most recently, I was out of work for a day about a month ago due to what I believe was a stomach bug. Upon returning to work, I was told by my supervisor that she's going to need to see more proof that I'm actually sick and not just taking time off for the heck of it. Now, I'm sure I'm not the best worker she's ever had, but I pride myself on never missing a day unless I'm in awful shape. And I hardly ever take vacation and I feel extremely guilty whenever I'm out of the office. Fast forward to two days ago. Not sure what happened, but I went from feeling completely normal to vomiting uncontrollably in a matter of 30 minutes. The vomiting and other fun excrement continued for the rest of the night. My first thought was, man, I'm not going to be able to work tomorrow, and how am I going to prove how sick I am again? This is when I thanked God for my trusty new iPhone. I pulled up the camera and turned on the video feature and recorded myself vomiting for about five minutes before looking at the camera and saying, Supervisor's name, I won't be coming in tomorrow. Hope this is good enough proof of how bad I feel. <laughs> back at work today, and she said she no longer needs proof that I'm ill. Our next Reddit post is from the Nerdy Mupton. This just happened. My bosses and I are still laughing. We are a small IT company. We manage quite a few clients though. This one gentleman at one of our busier client sites says that he's tired of being told his emails never arrive to him. We look it up, and yes, a couple of legit emails got tangled up in the spam filter. No big deal. We whitelist the sender and release the message. No, not good enough for this guy. He calls back screaming. I order you to let any email addressed to me come to my inbox. I advise him that I'm going to have to transfer him to IT security and he's going to have to, on a recorded line, say he understands and accepts responsibility for yada yada yada. See, I did that because these guys get thousands of spam emails a day. A while back, several folks, this guy included, decided to give their email addresses and passwords to some unsavory website, then did it again, and again, and again. So now, they get easily 15 to 20 messages an hour to the entire organization. So he accepts, saying he just wants all his emails to go to him. We allow all messages to him to bypass the spam filter. Three hours later, he has over a hundred new emails and they keep coming in. He calls back, furious, asking why his spam filter isn't working. Sir, you asked that all emails addressed to you arrive at your inbox. Update, so right around 4.45 PM today, he's calling our office and the call gets routed to me since I own the ticket. He's livid. Shouting so loud, my coworkers on the opposite side of the room can hear him. Whatever you did to my email, I want it put back to the way it was. You effed up my email and now I can't get any work done because my stupid notifications are going off every second. I calmly reply, absolutely. I'll go ahead and turn your spam filtering back on and all these emails will stop. Good, it's what you should have done in the first place. At the end of it all, nothing changed, and he's happy. God, I love IT work. Final edit. I had to. I logged into our system this morning from home and listened to the recording. It's glorious. Here's the highlights. So, OP tells me you're looking to turn off the spam filter. I don't even get spam. I'm paying you people for something I don't need. It's not an added cost, but you're not getting spam because you have a spam filter. If you turn that off, you're going to get flooded with spam emails. I don't care. I've given you guys an order and I expect it to be done. I just need you to be aware that without the spam filter, you're open to getting every spam email that comes to you. Some of which may be malicious and could open you up to viruses, malware, and all sorts of software that could compromise your entire network. By going against our suggestions, you understand that our company cannot be held liable for any malicious software that makes it onto your network, infects any of your systems, or causes any system downtime and that you're claiming sole responsibility for that. Do you understand this? Yeah, whatever. Just get it done so I can get off this call. Sir, I really need to reiterate how much we cannot recommend this action. You're going to get, I don't care, do what I tell you. Okay, 
I'll have OP remove you from the default spam rule, and you'll start receiving any email sent to you. Again, it's going to be a lot. The spam filter actually does catch a lot of spam. I. Don't. Care. Just. Do. It. Okay then, thank you. Have a good day. Click. Then, we have a similar story from I'm Caffeinated Chris down in the comments. I once had a saleswoman complain she was getting like 2-3 to three spams a week. I had metrics that told me how many were blocked for her and how many got delivered marked as spam. The policy was if it was iffy, we would mark and still deliver. I was blocking a ton of spam for the company. One day, I get a call from the company owner asking why saleswoman is getting so many spam. I'm like, you've gotta be kidding me. So I let her and the owner know I'll be tweaking her spam rules. And then I turned them off for a month. All the while, she's being buried in spam. I keep telling her I'm working on it and still trying to get them correct. By the second week, she's begging for me to fix it. Nope, I hang on for a full month. Then I simply turn it right back on to where it was before. She never complained about a few spams a week again. These stories make me think that the way IT professionals keep their clients happy is by letting their clients screw it up and then just reverting the changes back to where it was before the client screwed it up and voila, they're magically happy. Our next Reddit post is from Jam and Cream. I used to work IT tech support for a large company and it was my first proper job. As such, I started as an apprentice. This story takes place about a year into my apprenticeship, so I still had much to learn. On this particular week, I was working the shift that started an hour earlier than everyone else, as in I was solely responsible for support before everyone else arrived at 9am. My manager sent me on a job quite a few miles south. It was going to take two days. On Monday, I informed my manager I'd be leaving Wednesday afternoon and coming back Friday afternoon and he'd need to cover my shift. It isn't my responsibility and I didn't need to say anything, but I thought I'd help him out by giving him a nudge. Mike, I'm on an early shift this week, so someone will need to cover my shift Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Cheers, mate! It came to Wednesday, and I suspected he hadn't arranged anything, so I thought I'd give him another nudge. Genuinely trying to help the guy out. Mike, just letting you know that my early shift will need covering for the rest of this week. Ah, uh, right you are. Thanks, pal. So, off I went on the Wednesday, thinking I was doing a great job and keeping everyone in the loop. We knocked the job out of the park and finished by Thursday evening, so I head to the hotel and enjoy some sweet, sweet expenses. Friday morning, I head out in a rental they'd given me for the trip and start the journey back to the office. I get a call from my manager. Where are you? Heading back, I've just set off. I'll be back in the... I don't see anything in your calendar. I didn't put anything in it. I told... The finance director came in this morning and couldn't access the system and you were supposed to be here for 8 a.m. I told you, speak to me when you get back. The finance director happens to be my boss's boss's boss. Not a dude you want to piss off. And he was pissed off. Turned out his network cable had come loose and he couldn't access the network. He sat stewing from 7am expecting someone to arrive by 8 and fix it, only to have no one turn up until 8.45, the head of IT. My boss's boss who took a fair few expletives on the chin. I arrived back at the office as planned, expected and informed, Friday afternoon. My manager calls me over and gives me a lecture on the importance of communication. I tell him, I told you Wednesday I'd be back Friday afternoon and my shift would need covering. He couldn't even look at me as he says the following in the most condescending manner possible, loud enough for the head of IT to hear. I don't know, OP. I've got a pretty good memory, and I don't recall that conversation. Then sends me to the head of IT, who gives me a bit of a sterner lecture on the importance of communication. The word disappointed was mentioned. I go back to my desk defeated, my victory in the South quashed and sullied. My manager finishes the barrage. Next time, put it in the calendar and tell everyone in writing. The words ricocheted around my mind for a while until they settled and sat imprinted in my brain. I chalked this up to a learning experience and carried on. Fast forward a few months later. The words lay dormant until a bizarrely similar situation occurs. I was sent on a job for a few days and was returning, once again on a Friday afternoon, and it just so happened to fall in a week when I was doing the early shift. As soon as I heard about the job, the words sprang back into life. Put it in the calendar. Tell everyone in writing. 
Now, I could have put the details on my trip into my personal calendar, but I thought, why not enter it into the IT department's shared calendar, which the head of IT is part of. And when telling everyone in writing, surely that means everyone involved the last time, the IT department, and of course, the finance director. So I send off an email to my manager with the IT department, and just for fun, the finance director copied in something like, Hi Mike, as you're already aware, I'll be working down south this week until Friday afternoon. I'm on the early shift, so this will need covering while I'm away. Some of my colleagues asked what that was about, and I informed them about my manager's memory issues. They smirk and continue working. I complete the job and arrive back Friday afternoon, exactly like before. And like before, the finance director came in early. And unbelievably, like before, he had issues getting into the system. Choice expletives were shared, words were had, but not with me. I only knew sh** had hit the fan when a colleague pulled me to one side and told me why Mike was in such a foul mood. In classic British style, he never said a word to me. And never has silence felt so vindicating. To those of you who have never worked in a corporate setting, let me give you the single most important piece of advice you'll ever get. Always CYOA. Cover your own ass. Our next Reddit post is from Adale1. Okay, quick preface, I'm in my 30s. I went to high school in the 90s and schools had a very different climate back then. I recently recalled this and thought I'd share it to hopefully give a few other people a laugh. Quick background info, I was in special ed. Not from any disability, but due to extreme hyperactivity. And I mean extreme. Though I was pretty much over the hyperactivity by the time I hit high school, it's not easy to get out of special ed. By this point though, I was in 100% regular classes and just had one class a day instead of study hall with a special ed teacher, who was basically there to help me if I needed help with any of my schoolwork. Because I was in special ed, I had what was called an IEP. No idea what it's an acronym for. Which was basically just a list of learning aids I could use if I needed them. Things like extended time on tests. I never actually used any of them, but I always had the option. One day, another kid did something. I got blamed and sent to detention. Now, like I said, I was a hyperactive kid and ended up getting detention in school a lot, but I was also very headstrong. If I had felt that I'd done something wrong, I'd accept whatever punishment without complaint, which to be fair, happened pretty frequently, lol. But if I felt I was being punished unjustly, well, I usually ended up raising enough sting to warrant a real punishment, lol. So I get in detention with a teacher I'd never seen before, and for the first time in my life, I had a teacher tell me to write lines. A punishment which I thought had died with the 70s. Remember those aids I had access to but never used? So I say, okay, I just need to use computer transcription from my IEP, so I'll do the lines on my computer. <laughs> I proceeded to type out the line once, copy it, paste it a hundred times, look over at my teacher and say, done. I was a fast typer back then, 130 words per minute fast. You'd be surprised what hyperactivity can be channeled into. So this was all of 20 seconds after I sat down at the computer. Teacher wasn't exactly happy with that, refused to accept it, and told me I'd have to do it by hand. She wouldn't let me use the computer for this. Now, understand, a teacher could decide not to accept one item from an IEP for a given assignment, within reason and with cause. But they cannot, by law, deny multiple things meant to address the same issue. In my case, I had, okay, have, barely legible handwriting. So I had multiple options to allow me to not handwrite my assignments. If requested, they have to make accommodations for said aides. I said, okay, I'll use dictation from my IEP then. <laughs> the teacher asks, meaning? I say the line verbally, and a staff member writes it down for me. And it looks like you're the only staff member here. And that's how I got a teacher to write a hundred lines for me. I actually have to give it to her for sticking it out and writing all a hundred lines, rather than dropping the assignment entirely, lol. Then we have this contribution from Zelda Spell Factory down in the comments. In the US, it's against the law for a teacher to deny a student the use of anything in an IEP. Teachers do it all the time, but it's still against the law. I learned a ton about IEPs from having a gifted but autistic child. We almost sued after a teacher told my child that he couldn't use an accommodation. 
It was one that was badly needed and that I had to fight way too hard to get. If it's in the IEP, the teacher cannot deny a student the right to use it, period. If the student doesn't want it, that's a whole other story. It's fine for the student to opt not to use it, but the teacher cannot deny it. After our trip to the lawyer, the school bent over backwards to do what we wanted, mostly because it would have cost them a fortune. If they lost, they would have to pay our lawyer fees on top of their own and the settlement. And we had them dead to rights because the idiot teacher wrote what she did down in a note and sent that home with my child. Then, when someone asks what happened to the teacher, she replies, She got fired. I was just one of the many who brought up stuff she'd done. She let another kid use her password to get around the net nanny. The kid got her computer caught in a porn NATO, then told his mom that he saw some great porn on the computer at school. When the school district tech guy saw that it was on her computer history, it was the last straw. That's a cool story, but I want to hear more about this porn NATO. That was r slash malicious compliance, and if you want to maliciously comply, then hit that like button.